Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee. Or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films... Head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. Hello and good evening to you, worthy friends. Welcome to the Next Real Speakeasy from Rashpixel.fm. I'm Andy Nelson, and that over there is Pete Wright. It is Pete Wright. The Next Real Speakeasy is a new show we'll be bringing to you each month in which we invite industry guests to join us, and instead of serving up their favorite cocktails, they'll serve up movies that they love. We'd like to welcome our guest to this week's show, actor Abraham Ben Ruby. Abe has been in TV shows like ER, The Bridge, Robot Chicken, Men in Trees, Parker Lewis Can't Lose, one of my favorites, and Amazon's Bosch as Rodney Belk, as well as movies like Little Boy, Big Hero 6, Open Range, U-Turn, Twister, The Man Who Wasn't There, and of course, the movie on which we met, Ambush at Dark Canyon. He's played characters as diverse as Fidel Castro, Santa Claus, and Darth Vader. There's a trio for you. And he's starring in the upcoming film The Finest Hours with Chris Pine, Ben Foster, and Casey Affleck. Avid gamer, comic book collector, amateur photographer, music lover, man on the warpath, Abraham Ben Ruby. Say hello to the folks, Abe. Thanks for having me, fellas. We sure yeah. love having you here. This is going to be a good conversation. Like I said, we're not actually here to talk about any of those wonderful projects that you have done in the past. No, we're actually here because you brought along a movie that you love and uh, one that you wanted to recommend to every one of our listeners. So we're going to talk about it with you. So uh, tell the people what movie you brought to the speakeasy tonight, Abe. I brought uh, the 1982 comedy classic, My Favorite Year, directed by Richard Benjamin. 
uh, starring the incomparable Peter O'Toole uh, and a young whippersnapper uh, named Mark Lynn Baker, who uh, your audience may may recognize from a TV show he was a part of called Bosom. No, what was it called? Uh, perfect, oh, perfect, perfect strangers. Perfect strangers. <laughs> I almost messed that up. Perfect Belky strangers. Mark yeah, with, uh, with Belky. <laughs> Belky. Uh, which was a big hit in the 90s. That They really did have a big hit with that show. Now, uh, I came to this movie in a weird way. Uh, I had a massive crush on this, on, a movie crush on the on the female lead. It was a woman named Jessica Harper because of a horror movie called Suspiria, which is a Dario Argento uh, kind of psychedelic, trippy, uh, murder, witch coven in a dance school movie. <laughs> <laughs> Which, if you guys have never seen that, that might be worth an, a whole nother podcast. I have, right, I have heard of it. Wasn't list. that like that's like crazy uh, '70s vibe, right? I mean, isn't that like early '70s somewhere? Yeah, in there? It's, it's late '70s oh, late Giallo 70s. Italian horror movie. It's very oh. trippy. The Italians know how to do it. That's the truth. Oh yes, Dario they do. Argento. Oh yes, they do. Uh, so my cousins had turned me on to that movie, uh, and from they, my cousins were the first people I knew who owned a VHS player, and they had gotten a hold of these European movies. Um, and so we all had a crush on this woman and then we were looking her up. They used to have massive books in the video rental stores with all the actors names and we were looking her up and we saw that she was in this other movie, uh, my favorite year, uh, which is a, a whole nother world. But I also love Peter O'Toole, of course. And uh, for me, I mean, Lawrence of Arabia is one of the great movies ever made and that's one of the great performances. And I think he, Peter O'Toole in this film uh, is extraordinary. I, he has so many bits, and he, it's just so different for him. And I, I just love him in this film. Yeah, he's so he's so good in this. And this is, geez, his one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh Oscar nomination and seventh loss. Wow, wow, <laughs> which is just shocking because I mean he is so good in in really everything that he does. Yeah, let's be honest. And uh, yeah, I mean not having seen this film before. Um, but being a Peter O'Toole fan myself, I mean, I just loved him in this. He just just was perfect as the kind of uh, the aged swashbuckler. It was just so great to see him playing kind of a that Errol Flynn. <laughs> yeah, the character. drunk Errol Flynn. I, you know, when he when they introduce the, his drunk suit, uh, I, that was that sent me like over the way. He's got the uh, the the uh, chauffeur who who happens to know that he has a strip off uh, snap off uh, suit. Uh, for when he's super drunk and can't undress himself, and then they just dump him in the pool in his underwear, or in the tub in his underwear. Priceless <laughs> Peter O'Toole moment. Priceless, and he's wearing tidy whities which uh, <laughs> is unexpected, <laughs> right? From Peter O'Toole, in the, Peter let O'Toole. alone uh, in the film. Yeah, and uh, gosh, he must be you know sixty already in this movie, and it's from nineteen eighty two. So, uh, but he's still just handsome and charming, and uh, he's uh, he's so genius in this, and he just he's mocking himself and his friends uh and 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 you know the legendary swashbucklers of hollywood which it's i just love the irreverence of his performance one of the things i like so much about his character is that you know i this this era this type of film has you know it's it had been done before and it has been done since uh i you know we we had the horrific radio land murders that kind of had the same vibe um uh, you know i, I I just think one of the things that Peter O'Toole brings to this thing is just so much heart, uh, and and he really allows himself to become a foil for Mark Lynn Baker's Benji Stone to to grow and change. And I think that makes this as as kind of a, a madcap comedy. It makes it something different for me. That's what makes it stand out. I agree with you. And and there's a a real charming innocence to this film as well that I think uh, we don't really get very often anymore. Um, and certainly they were portraying a time of, of, of innocence and, and the newness of television. It's, uh, it's set in 1954 uh, at NBC uh, on the set of a, a, a live comedy show um, that I don't know what real show you would compare it to. Uh, my history on that is a little shady. But um, I, I think they say, well, and what I've read is actually Sid Caesar's show of shows. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. That makes sense. So I think it's called the Comedy Cavalcade. Uh, and this week's guest is a legendary swashbuckling movie hero named Alan Swan, played by Peter O'Toole. Uh, and Mark Lynn Baker plays a sort of uh, 
neophyte writer, comedy writer on the show. Um, and everybody's excited for Alan Swan to be joining them. And when he does finally show up, he's a bit sauced. <laughs> and so, just a bit. Yeah, just a bit. And Mark Lynn Baker is uh, put in charge of getting him to set on time and, and just being his uh, his chaperone in general. And the comedy ensues. Uh, there are all, several other little plots. There's a little love story uh, with the aforementioned uh, Jessica Harper, who's cute as a button in this film. <laughs> and uh, gosh, I bet she still looks good. And then there's sort of an interesting little subplot with a gangster who the the television show, the fictional television show, has been mocking, and this gangster shows up and tries to get them to stop using his likeness in a sketch, which I think is really funny. Uh, Joseph Bologna plays just this larger-than-life TV star with a giant ego, and uh, <laughs> he has some of the greatest moments in the, in the film, too, actually. Um, but that's the gist, and then you come to find out that uh, Peter O'Toole is not all he. Peter O'Toole's character, Alan Swan, is not all he seems to be, and there's more uh, than what you see on the surface. And he's got a young daughter, um, and uh, is a bit estranged from her. And there's some really heart-jerking moments uh, in relation to that story as well. So it's it's nice. It's really well crafted film writing wise. Everything ties together, and there's no there's no downtime. There's a weird sort of montage when they're riding a horse, but other than that, <laughs> it's all <laughs> it's all uh, it's all action and comedy, and it's really fun. There was a great uh, another great moment uh, uh, sequence is when uh, Benji kind of reluctantly takes Alan home to dinner to because uh, his to mother meet his invites mother. <laughs> <laughs> His mother invites them back to Brooklyn, which is fantastic. And you see uh, Lainey Kazan uh, as his mother, and uh, her her husband. It was just a the funniest pairing those two because he was what was he he was the the former Thai uh, wrestling champ uh, yeah like a Malaysian <laughs> bantamweight Karoka Karoka <laughs> and but you get this uh, this really funny. A family, kind of like this Jewish family scene as they're kind of introducing their relatives. And then it turns out all of the basically people in the entire building, everybody's excited that Alan Swan is here. But there's also this amazing moment of just real kind of touching heart between Benji's mom and Alan as she kind of talks to him about his daughter. And that was what I loved about this movie is it it gets some real madcap comic moments like when Alan is rappelling down the side of the building with the fire hose. One of my favorite or, scenes. <laughs> which is great. <laughs> or the whole the whole climax, which is also we'll ha- definitely have to talk about that. But then you've got these really touching moments and they they generally revolve around him and his daughter and just kind of his life as he's trying to sort it out, Alan Swan. That powerful moment right here with what she says to him and, and how that ends up kind of affecting him really became kind of the the crux of that emotional uh, core of this film for me. And I just, I really loved that. Well, what does she say to him? She says, uh, they're yeah. talking, they're, they've finished dinner and they're saying, you know, this is what's important, Swanee uh, family and a good meal and, and uh, you know, being with the people you love. And uh, he confesses that he's estranged from his daughter and she actually says shame on you and he really that really hits him hard in such a real way for for peter o'toole too you can really i love he's having so much fun making this film you can just see the joy in all of his moments and then you get to that moment that you just described andy and it is it's real i mean he's really thinking of something specific in his true life that He's ashamed of that. That was that added. Uh, I was worried uh, actually about that sequence when I when when that hit because I thought, okay, this this could go maudlin so fast, right? I mean, this could the rest of the film could be just a maudlin sentimentality, uh, a bit of maudlin sentimentality, and they it, it was it ended up being such a well balanced bit where we get to learn about O'Toole and the journey that he goes through. He goes to stalk his daughter, which but he does it sweetly and then uh, we move on and like we get to learn that lesson with him and i you know i look at that i in terms of just the the overall structure of the story uh it's really elegant and uh the, the writers of this thing norman steinberg and dennis palumbo um i i think are 
Well, first of all, they're terrific. And Norm Steinberg is behind one of my very favorite, uh, and I'm going to call it guilty pleasure, although I don't feel that guilty about it, Johnny Dangerously. Oh, I didn't know uh, that. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's oh, a good one. Yeah. Oh, and uh, Blazing Saddles, it. too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah Blazing right. Saddles, too, yeah. So. I, I definitely don't feel guilty about that. No, no. <laughs> but also, uh, and this is the connection that I wanted to make, he was a showrunner for Cosby for a long time. Oh, nice. And and that, to me, that was a Cosby moment with Lainey Kazan. And, I, you know, she was, uh, I think she was uh, Mrs. Cosby right there. And and uh, she got to, to teach him something really beautifully maternal and, and give it to us and wrap it up as a, in a little bow and then let us move on with the story. And I think that was just really elegantly done. I totally agree. And when he calls it back as he and Benji are walking through Central Park, he calls it back and, you know, he says, your mother said, shame on me. And she was right. And then he sees the policeman's horse and they, and they <laughs> launch <laughs> off, which, uh, which I think is a great. Uh, what was the policeman doing? Was he taking a he leak? Was going to take a he leak was either in the bushes. taking a leak or going to see his lover in the bushes. One the <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't even think about the uh, t- going to see his lover in the bushes. I definitely prefer that. Yeah. <laughs> God, that's a, what a New York cop is going to go take a leak in Central Park. I mean, you know, they, I know that happens, go, but not go. by a cop. <laughs> sure. <laughs> his pants are so tight, that cop. You guys wonder. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's true. That's funny. Uh, what do we think of uh, What do we think of Richard Benjamin as, as a director of this thing? I, I'm I was really surprised rewatching it to to learn that he was the director. I mean, I'd forgotten that he had actually directed quite a bit of comedies, uh, quite a few comedies in the '80s. And uh, I, I mean, I have no nothing to fault him on this film for sure. I I just you don't even notice the direction, which I think is. A wonderful quality. You know, he was in Westworld and Catch-22. Sunshine Boys. Deconstructing Harry. What else did he direct? I know there's some other movie that I love of his, right? Like, uh, oh, I see. Oh, yeah. Mermaids. Money Pit. Money Money Pit. Pit. That's the one for me, baby. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, in terms of his, I mean, his his direction in this thing is, I think he's, he uh, he seems to me he plays it pretty straight. And and I think that ends up being a good decision when you're shooting Peter O'Toole. Yeah, I agree. And the performances are so, I mean, they're just so broad and and rich. Uh, You know, and and I say broad, and some people might uh, take that the wrong way, but I I actually like that. I like it when actors make big choices and, and go for it. Uh, it doesn't always have to be just uh, breathing through your teeth and whispering. <laughs> you know? No, there's something to be said for big performances. Absolutely. And I think, you know, in the world of comedy, uh, and, and Richard Benjamin certainly has lived kind of in that world with the, the projects that he's done. I mean, you really have to find the balance for that, you know, both for the comedy and for the, the drama that, that uh, can come out of that as well. And I think that he shows right here in his first uh, theatrical feature that he kind of has a good handle on that. And, you know, I really enjoy the way that uh, both he and the writers balanced the the gravitas along with kind of some of the madcap comedy all throughout this film. Yeah, it's it's got a really nice uh, uh, yin and yang to it. It was, yeah. better, it was better than my stepmother is an alien. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oh, Peter O'Toole, John Lovitz, you take your pick. I feel like every movie that you badmouth on this program, you're going to have to watch and review. <laughs> you know what? I I actually uh, I actually have been known to put on Stepmother as an alien every now and again. Wow, wow! That that doesn't make it that doesn't make it better than my favorite year. But I'm just saying. Okay, I'm an equal opportunity uh, binger. Oh, well, I remember loving that one when it came out. Although yeah. I, I don't give myself much credit for some of the films that I loved back then. But uh, I haven't gone back to revisit it. Kim Basinger was in that was in that category of like it was Kim Basinger, it was Kelly LeBrock, it was like these were right, my you crushes. Still go see it, exactly. and uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. I could I could just be standing still and just like waiting for a bus <laughs> for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly LeBrock, that's pretty much you just summed up her career in a nutshell. No offense to her. <laughs> no offense to her. No. See now you have to no, go watch every you, Kelly. Kelly LeBrock movie. Oh, she's brilliant in Weird Science, right? So. <laughs> she's brilliant. Oh, there you go. <laughs> we got to talk about Mark Lynn Baker. Okay. Yeah, man, Mark Lynn Baker. Uh, I mean, Perfect Strangers, that is really where I knew him from. And other than, I think he was in uh, Noises Off, the uh, Peter Bogdanovich version of that, uh, uh, when they, he made that film. 
But other than that, it's like I have not seen him in anything. And I know he's done stuff, but man, it was so great seeing him here. It was just, it, it was perfect for this role. Yeah, and he's so young and, and I, you just feel like he's a total Broadway New York actor. I mean, there's no question that he's he's got that under his, in his tool belt. Uh, and he's just flawless, man. He, every, I mean, there are some great moments. The, the aforementioned favorite scene where they're on the, uh, they're on the rooftop of a building and they're going to use a fire hose to rappel <laughs> down the side into a party. Peter O'Toole and Mark Lynn Baker. And Mark Lynn Baker is trying to open the door and, and keep Peter O'Toole from going over the side of the building. And he does these sort of like, he'll run out towards the camera, like take three big steps and go, and deliver his line and then go back to the door. And I think that's so like, that's such a Broadway move. And it's it works really well in that, in that scene. It is a total Broadway move. That's so funny that you say it's very cartoony. Like that's the only place where the, the thing becomes kind of a lampoon of itself. And that's exactly what he did in Perfect Strangers. Yeah. too which is why yeah. there were 150 episodes of that show but you know i you're right like I, you know this this is one of those uh, roles that really kind of cemented who this guy was i think as an actor and i wonder if he didn't if it didn't uh uh hurt the variety of roles that he ended up getting it seems like it could have could have done especially at that time yeah when mm-hmm. there were i mean isn't this you know 1982 isn't this is the same year as blade runner right it's like yeah right after we had that it was a lot of uh, a lot changed exactly right yeah i mean he's got it's just so much tv until he really gets locked into uh, perfect strangers and since then, it's been some one-off. He's he did uh, twins, um, a couple episode of Law and Order. I mean, he's it's it's too bad we don't see more of him because he's he's charmingly, surprisingly talented in this film. I found myself really just kind of mesmerized by his charisma on screen. I think it's interesting that Richard Benjamin actually brought him back for the TV movie version of Laughter on the Twenty Third Floor, which was another. Uh, project that some of these writers that worked for Sid Caesar on his show actually wrote. This one was by Neil Simon that he wrote kind of about writers writing for a show like that. And so this was done in 2001 and Mark Lynn Baker was in that one as well. So that ends up being an interesting kind of segue. You bring up Neil Simon. I mean, I was really surprised at the... the I, I had no idea the sort of connective tissue between this and, and show of shows. And I mean, I loosely had the reference that uh, King Kaiser was Sid Caesar uh, and uh, you know that, uh, but but that uh, there are these really direct connections between you know the the role that obviously Errol Flynn uh, was being sent up uh, by Peter O'Toole that uh, Benji Stone's character is uh, is uh, uh, an amalgamation of Mel Brooks and Woody Allen who both had written for Show of Shows and that uh, Herb. The silent writer who whispers to everybody was actually Neil Simon. He that he was the Neil Simon in that role, and he he uh, uh, he chose to, according to Carl Reiner, he said he even Simon used to whisper to everybody because he didn't like to shout over the screams in the writer's room. That's too loud for him. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, it ends up being a really interesting. It's a much more interesting film to me to know the to to kind of read up on a little bit of the history of how it came how it came to be because those I feel like I have a much more personal relationship with those people. Yeah, that's cool. I yeah. I didn't know that and never even would have thought to research it. So I'm glad you did. And Selma Selma Diamond, who um, is one of those actresses who I totally recognized, but I just like I couldn't figure out from where until I looked at her. She was in Night Court. She played the the costumer oh, here. Yeah, yeah, she's yeah, the costumer. Remember, she was like she, the one of the bailiffs with bull yeah, right exactly she also was one of the writers for show of shows oh no oh, that's fantastic yeah. so it's, oh. it's all through the dna of this film i had no exactly. idea exactly yeah, that I, voice that is <laughs> exactly. the voice <laughs> that's another right great, that's one of the great lines in the movie uh peter o'toole finds himself <laughs> in the women's restroom and she comes out of the stall and she's what does she say to him she says this is for ladies only and, he, and you just hear a zipper going down and he says so is this mom but occasionally I've got to run some water through it <laughs> and then cut to the hot dog Exa- oh, cut my. to the hot dog exactly <laughs> getting slathered with mustard <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's oh, good. good that's stuff. really 80s good. comedy right there, buddy. Oh man, yeah. it's all over it. I mean, you got to talk about Joe Bologna. It's he's just ridiculous in this. It, it, Joseph yeah. Bologna, I should say. I don't know. Uh, he, Bologna. It was uh, Joseph who played King uh, King, Kaiser. King Kaiser, right? Yep. yep. And he's so like in charge and alpha 
throughout and then it gets to show day and he's like he's got the wrong script and he's in the wrong wardrobe <laughs> and he's freaking out and he's having a panic attack it's really funny well that was the funniest part because he you know it starts with him having the light drop and almost kill him right the light falls on the stage as he takes two feet a step two feet to the right and and suddenly uh he's he's he i guess it's a it's it's kind of the cascade of of what you think is a unique experience of bad luck uh, until you start to see that he's just a mess, and people refer to him being a mess every single week. You know, he's oh, he's always in the wrong outfit. You know, at the, he is uh, for being a guy. You're right, man. For being a guy who's totally in control the entire time, it's really cool to see him fall apart. Yeah, and he falls apart so well. The other thing that I want to bring up, you know, we talk about the structure of the script, and I think that one of the things that was really cool about this is that he is anchor around. This it, it it's not only a, a mob story but a labor dispute, right? I mean, it's a the the guy he's sending up is this is this union, this labor leader, right. and they have a sequence. They they kickstart this particular storyline with a sequence in the office about uh, that is about I'm I'm a guy who removes things, right? And and he sees uh, this labor leader comes to meet him, and he starts taking things out of the office and saying, "See, I remove things." He throws them out. He throws a, a poster out a window and says, "I feel so much better." <laughs> <laughs> and what's so great about Bologna's performance here is that uh, he really has such incredible confidence in this wildly, uh, uh, like, impossible scenario. Like, what is it that gives him so much confidence to stand up to a mobster uh, and then completely fall apart when he has to actually do his job? It reminds me of that great Seinfeld episode where, he, where Jerry was dating that girl who, uh, who she was a crier. And she like dropped a hot dog on the floor. She's like in tears. She's bawling because the hot dog's dirty. And then somebody calls and says, your grandmother died. She's like, oh, well, I guess it was time. And she goes on about her business. That's kind of what it reminded me of. Like this guy who's supposed to be so confident ends up just dominating a mobster uh, and then uh, falls apart when it's time to do his job. He was awesome. Although it's great that once the mob once the mobsters uh thugs came in at the end to, cut, to kind of take him down that is the almost like the thing that gave him back his confidence <laughs> like take it on as he just kind of starts taking those guys out on the stage which was great yeah it's, it was a funny twist right like it almost felt like this was the lesson we're learning about his character is that maybe he was in the wrong field yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's a good point there's the great moment in the uh in that fight at the end where there's like a delivery boy or something and he's like singing a song and punching on the beat. He's going like, hey, 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 oh, hey, hey, hey. And he's punching in the middle of the thing. It's in a little dance. Uh, it's just, uh, <laughs> he was like jumping up and down. He was so cute. Stuff like that anymore, man. It's crazy. It's so, they really so don't. So funny. And then uh, there's also uh, Bill Macy who plays uh, Cy. Uh, not the Bill Macy of Shameless, not the William H. Macy, but uh, mm-hmm. old character. The other Bill. Bill right. Macy, yeah. I don't know if they're related. I don't think so. Um, uh, and he's just bombastic and obnoxious and then turns out to be this obsequious guy. And it's just really, that's a really great performance in this film as well for me. He's another fantastic character. He's still around, right? I mean, he's not, he's not acting. The last thing he did, he was, it was 2010. Yeah, yeah, that's a is. that's a crazy career. Now he was great in this. I loved how he uh, caved so quickly <laughs> <laughs> as soon as King Kaiser came around. Like he was so tough and everything, but then as soon as King said, "Oh, this script is terrible," you're right. We're going to change it for you, King. Oh, that was great. And then that that moment when uh, King is is trying to figure, you know, talking to KC about buying him a gift, and he's kind of peeking through his eyes uh-huh. like oh, Here's- white walls. <laughs> Oh God! The, make him make him green. <laughs> it was really good. He was, uh, you know, in terms of the the writers' room kind of experience, he made it uh, just a real delightfully contentious place. You know, where you can tell he's yelling and screaming, and everybody's doing what he says, but really they don't. They just see it as bluster, and they're, it's just going through the motions. It made the writers' room uh, ironically appealing. Yeah, and I had to comment on O'Toole's entrance to the writers' room. So good. He comes in drunk, and and ha- he does a flip onto the table and lays himself out and then and passes out on the table brilliant yeah almost as good as his uh his entrance to the film when he wakes up in bed with with two stewardesses and then he has this cough that is the most insane <laughs> like almost painful cough that i've ever heard because uh, it's you, like 
it's like his soul is leaving his body or something. And you get everything about him in that like thirty <laughs> seconds too. It's like he's uh, it's so good. Uh. <laughs> so it was so well structured. Just that scene yeah. that he wakes up with this woman, and they, we, the camera is so close on them, and it's just this really kind of okay. He's obviously a philanderer of some sort, and this is kind of sweet. She's probably into him for money and fame and whatever. And then the other stewardess shows up, and she's all dressed. Uh, and and we feel you you kind of get the picture that now he's a philanderer and and it really good at at, at it. Yeah, and <laughs> she's got a tray full of mini and alcohol serving. bottles, <laughs> she's and then he pulls one out him. from his crotch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's that's a big point of the movie too. Is he's just a drunk and he's got there's a great um, scene where his chauffeur uh, and that's another actor we should talk about also. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, there's a great scene where his chauffeur is searching his coat, his top coat, for a, the last bottle, the hidden stash of booze. And there's like all these pockets inside the coat, and he, <laughs> he rattles it, and you hear the liquid, and that and that's how he discovers it. And I just thought that was really smart. And the pocket he pulls it out of is like a pocket that if you were wearing the jacket, it would be kind of on your butt, like yeah. the small of your back in a long cashmere coat. Exactly. I want That's that class. Coat. No kidding. Right. Secret pockets everywhere. Uh, uh, the, yeah. the chauffeur. Yeah. Tony, yeah. Tony Di Benedetto. Yeah. Gosh, what, uh, what's name. his deal? Oof. Did you guys look him up? He's, uh, well, we, we, did he was, we, how much did we talk about him in Splash? I don't think we did at all, but uh, his part was great. He was Tim the doorman in Splash. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's the one who, yeah, oh, he yeah, tells, yeah, yeah. uh, yeah, it tells her where to go shopping. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, just one of those New York dudes, you know. Totally. Exactly. Back when they just, made out films in New York, he was in. Um, uh, he was Bert the bartender in one of my favorite adaptations, Death Trap, with Michael Caine. Oh and God, I love Reed. that movie too. Yeah, that yeah. is a great film. Classic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah classic Sydney. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Sydney Lumet, right? Uh, yeah, he's been around. He's got uh, he's got some some solid credits. He hasn't done anything uh, since looks like ninety nine. Uh, but which was and that, that was, was analyze, analyze this, this oh, like wow. uh, with uh, De Niro and Billy Crystal. He's probably one of those, you know, he's one of those New York dudes who I'm sure used to be in the hanging out with those guys, right? Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah. and he just exudes it in this film. Oh, totally. Like, totally. He York just dude. owns, yeah. uh, owns his thing. Yeah, it, and and his whole setup is the it's it's the relationship with a guy who drives cars that I always want. Like, whenever I come to town. This guy drops everything and brings me a car yeah. and just drives me around. That's that is uh, that's a classic uh, relationship. Well, you just got to be a movie star. You can work that out. <laughs> you know, they don't do that for podcasters. Um, not yet. <laughs> okay. Hey, it's We're still new. It's, it's still, still new. Yeah, yeah, the technology's it's growing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Soon. Yeah. Right. Right. Soon. Oh, so funny. So funny. I love George George Weiner. Um, he's in this as as Rochex, the the mob boss's uh, assistant or his lawyer. <laughs> oh, yeah. When he brings him to the meeting, he's just one of those faces that uh, you like. I remember him from Spaceballs as uh, yes, as Dark, yeah. Dark Helmet's right hand man. That's like the, you know, for me, that's where I remember him from. But I mean, yeah, he's got 180 <laughs> credits, so he's definitely definitely a busy man. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about all these, you know, just what we were saying about the connection of those New York guys. From the seventies, you know, probably from the early seventies, right up through the nineties. Well, the quintessential odd couple, nineteen seventy one. His first, uh, his first credited role here. I mean, you just, you, you said it. There you go. You know, I yeah. have a, a great friend, uh, Jeff Golden, who I used to stay at his place in New York when I was there, and uh, he he had a television, but he didn't have cable or anything, so he, it was the, the the coat hanger antenna. And basically the only show he could get was The Odd Couple because in New York at that time, in the 90s, they would literally show The Odd Couple 24 hours a day. You could always find it on one channel or another. (laughs) And he had a theory that the quintessential New York television show was The Odd Couple and the quintessential Los Angeles television show was Three's Company. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which which I think is pretty right on the money. That's right. It's, it's, it's it a all. sad testament, but it's really, really true. <laughs> you know, if you think about the apartment in Three's Company, it's just so, like, ghetto, bad Santa Monica stucco. And, uh, yeah, it's funny. Somebody uh, else yeah, brought up the, the odd couple. That's what I think of every time I hear that. I'm sorry. It's Three's Company. 
<laughs> just that story. That's, that's, how, it go, that's how it goes. That's how it goes. You think of the odd couple, you go to Three's Company. Well, yeah. As it should be. Yeah. The odd triple. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, George Weiner, uh, uh, Selma Diamond as Lil. The uh, the one that uh, that jumps off the page to me uh, for me is uh, Cameron Mitchell, who plays uh, Ro- Rocek. Rocek? Ro- right. Carl the Ro- the, the mob mobster, boss, right? The real mob right. boss. Yeah. Now, this right. is a dude. He is serious. He is one serious badass. Serious. Yeah, and and at 241 credited roles, uh, he's he's up there and has been around for a long, long time. Uh, first credited role, the last installment, a short in 1945. Uh, so this was this film was hit right uh, smack in the middle of his his career, uh, and he was a he was big in you know pretty much named the big genre uh, of the of the period and he was he was in films and television of that period big in westerns swiss family robinson jeremiah worth uh he was uh he's been in a lot of stuff and when he's in the other side of the wind that's the uh the orson welles film that they're yeah. trying to finish up to release Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's crazy. How interesting. So he's got to be one of those guys that you know Richard Levinson was like, "Let me try and get me this guy," and, and they got him. You know, it's like crazy, that right? Exactly. exactly. I can't. I can't think. Aaron, Andy, have we talked about him? And I'm searching for through his credits. I can't. It doesn't look like we've talked about him uh, before. Yeah, I don't think we've talked about no, Cameron I don't think Mitchell so either. Before. Yeah, uh-uh. but, uh, no. he's, he started his uh, his non film career as an Air Force bombardier. Uh, prior to uh, that was his role in World War II, uh, and uh, came back and hit Broadway and and then uh, television. Passing of the third floor back. Uh, his uh, film debut was What Next, Corporal Hargrove. Crazy long career. He was terrific, if, if brief in this film. You know, there's there's another scene that uh, I think is equally funny and also very touching. It's the scene when. Uh, when Alan Swan takes uh, takes Benji to the Stork Club, and you've got this wonderful scene where where Alan is kind of wooing this young woman across the room, and then he has this wonderful scene where he ends up uh, dancing with this uh, this uh, Mrs. Horn character, and it's very touching just seeing the two of them dance, and then of course it uh, it erupts into insanity as he ends up as Benji stages this this uh, spilling of this tray onto this guy that the the hot girl's with so that Alan can steal the hot girl and make off with her quite funny but i love that the uh that moment with the the other woman is so touching as they're dancing and that woman is actually uh, Gloria Stewart of uh of Titanic fame at least recently wow whoa that's interesting whoa. yeah it's, Gloria it's, Stewart like the with through the jewels off the ship that's her yeah from the invisible man yeah right wow there she is here that's she is, a as connection. The, as the lady dancing with him. Yep. That is. That's. Crazy. I didn't make that at all. I saw her and I'm like, gosh, she's so familiar to me, but I couldn't figure out why. And then I was uh, kind of digging through the credits and the, yeah, I turned her up. Gloria Stewart. There she is. Wow. And she doesn't. I don't think she speaks even in the film. It's, it, that's an amazing. But it is a great moment. The whole restaurant stops to watch them dance, and it's very elegant and romantic. Exactly. Yeah. I, you know, I wasn't paying as much attention to credits uh, when Titanic came out, but somebody told me uh, it had the nerve, and I had the nerve not to check, to tell me that, oh, no, she was just found. She was, somebody made up a story. She's got a ton of credits. She's been around forever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Man, she was, she I'm an a... idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Don't listen to those. It was probably me. We were probably drinking. <laughs> Back when you used to make up movie trivia, you're right. That's I'm right. sure that's, that's well, what you happened. know. That's half of everything I've said in this podcast. <laughs> I'm just making it up. You guys added in the, the correct information. Now. That's why we. I'm going to do some. Yeah, I'm going to do some ADR for for you. Yeah, well, good. Yeah, just let me know what I need to replace. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, I did want to talk about Ralph Burns, the music. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I don't want to talk much about it. I just want to say it's terrific. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the things that I, I like so much about Ralph Burns, he, he, uh, and what I think works so well, first of all, it's, it's, it's great period music. I think he does a, a great job just sort of, you know, capturing the experience inside the, uh, the frenetic um, uh, kind of pl- palace of 30 Rock. Uh, but he also, it, it's got a lot of 
a Broadway kind of feel to it. You know, you talk about uh, Mark Lynn Baker and his Broadway movements. Well, the music just really celebrates that sort of Broadway, um, the the Broadway waves of, of sound that kind of come over you. And I thought it just, uh, it really worked very, very well to tie the whole, the whole picture together. I like that too. And that made me think of uh, something else I, I would talk about, which is uh, there are some uh, clips from the Alan Swan movies that are shown. And I think that those are really well made and really clever. And there's actually a great scene between Mark Lynn Baker and Jessica Harper, where he finally, he's been pursuing her for a date for half the movie. And he finally gets her to agree to dinner and a movie. And he orders like a mountain of Chinese food. They have like 85 containers of Chinese food on the table. And then he's showing her clips from the Alan Swan movies and he's doing the dialogue over the film and she's shushing him and it's just it's really those little tiny little bits of the alan swan classic films are also really well made and i really like that element of it there was one in particular that totally stuck out to me, and I, I don't know which, obviously, which one it was, but he had just uh, fought a bunch of people on the stairway, the stone stairway, and the camera is high up, uh, you know, trucked high up, and then he walks kind of up to the this woman so far back in the on the stage, and the camera takes this long, 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 crushing, long uh, zoom into them, and uh, and they it's it's long enough and sweet enough that when the when our camera pulls out. And we realize we're behind Mark Lynn Baker and uh, and uh, her Jessica as as they're now in the writers' room, and she says, "I guess this is the kissing part." Yeah, yeah. It's like not. <laughs> it's not too much. No, it's not too much. I'm like, oh, I can. I'll buy that. Yeah, That's sweet. Right. I want to be in the kissing part. Yeah, yeah, you do. At you that do. Moment, you want to be in the kissing. Do. And she's cute, man. I'm telling oh, you, yeah. Suspiria. Yeah. <laughs> no, I believe it. it's next on the list. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do a series for her. Pennies from Heaven, uh, this, and Suspiria. I think it'll make a good little trilogy. That is a good... She's in Pennies from Heaven? Yeah. With Steve Martin? Steve she Martin. Is. Oh, man. I uh-huh. watch that uh, right. Wait, and then she turns up in Minority Report. <laughs> sure. Oh, wow. So she's still cracking yes. away at it a little bit. That's, see, that's yeah, what that's I'm right. saying. She's out there for me somewhere. She is. She, she just she doesn't know. <laughs> oh, she's in the blue iguana. I have a bunch of friends in that. I have to grill them. <laughs> See if any of them have their <laughs> number. Tell me more. Yes. Uh, okay. Oh, gosh, I'm connected. Ooh, and shock, <laughs> shock treatment. The Rocky Horror sequel. Wow. Was it? Yeah. Oh, well, that's right. It I mean, was. it's not. It's barely a sequel, but it's made by the same guy, uh, um, whose name is Richard uh, O'Brien. Yeah, right. Yeah. Do they act it out? The kind of thing that can you go do a shock treatment I kind of event? Plays, oh, she plays they, Janet. I think they tried to do like an, a Rocky Horror style thing with shock treatment. I don't. I never witnessed it, but mm. I, I would bet that that was part of the appeal. There was one night when we had so at midnight they'd show Rocky Horror, and then for the really late night crowd they'd have another one from two to four. <clears throat> and that's how I saw El Topo, which is a Alejandro Jodorowsky movie. If you guys are unfamiliar, oh, with I've heard it. I've heard of that one, but I haven't seen it. Yeah, well, that's a crazy psychedelic western uh, uh, that will <laughs> that at least for me made me never want to watch John Wayne or Clint Eastwood ever again. Really? <laughs> oh, really? No, I just want to watch the weird ones. <laughs> <laughs> Well, because well, this was because uh, you're you're you, what what you were seven when you, when when you would have seen that you're because when were you born? Like you were. I'm, I was born in 69, and uh, so I would have seen Rocky Horror probably like 85 or 86, so it would have yeah. been right around there. Yeah. 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 That's a, that's about the same. I, I can't, I'm actually surprised when I miss this. This was not big in uh, in the Colorado Springs drive-in uh, chains. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah I haven't. <laughs> no, I think we had some weird, like, drug-addled punk rock dude who was doing the programming at, at our late night yeah. movie theater. So <laughs> that's how we wound up with El Topo. And the Devils. I saw a movie there called The Devils, which is the most twisted movie I've ever seen. 
Uh, the devils. <laughs> all right. See, I'm making look at all these movies I'm I writing know. down. We're gonna have all these lists. We're gonna now, do a thing to watch. Uh, if, <laughs> Abe I've, series. I've got the weird ones. That's my deal. <laughs> this this, this is my why, favorite you know year. What, wait, is so it's such a tame movie for my taste. <laughs> that is the whole thing. You know, I'm I'm looking at the stuff you have done. I'm looking at uh, at you at the you got Comic Con interviews of you talking about how you're such a, uh, a you celebrate such geek culture and you're such a fan of Star Wars and Star Trek and all these great things and uh, and so are we and then you pick this film which is practically vaudeville yeah uh it was it was a surprise well i and it's funny because i'm not a huge fan of comedy films but for some reason this one uh i've always just loved there are a handful for sure um but i i mean I just think this is one of the great performances. Peter O'Toole in this film is one. It's, for me, it's one of the great performances uh, ever committed to film. That's perfect. That is a that is a testimonial uh, that stands uh, head and shoulders uh, above these other cheap write ups. New York Times, please. <laughs> Andy, I know this is a, a, a little bit of a, a unique thing, but did you do? Did you look up how it uh, performed originally? Yeah, this film uh, did well for itself. I couldn't find any information on the budget for this film, so I have no idea what it actually cost. I don't know if you've heard anything, Abe. No, no idea. Domestically, it ended up making about twenty million dollars uh, adjusted. That's about uh, forty-eight point five million. So it did pretty well for itself. That's about. Uh, I don't have the adjusted profit per finished minute because we don't have that, but it still did. Uh, it did well for itself. It it opened. <laughs> it opened at number three. Behind uh, Officer and a Gentleman and E.T. Oh, wow. Sure. Right? Right. That's a big year. That's competition. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's All tough. Right. Well, I think, uh, I, think we should try, I think we should try and rank it, Andy. Let's give it a try. All right. So we're going to head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel. And we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to do a little three-way. Uh, 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 this actually will be really good because we have a tiebreaker. Uh, you That's go to right. flickchart.com slash the next reel and you log in, you make sure you have an account, you log in and just start with our golden ticket list. Start at the top and, and start ranking them. And let's see if your top films line up with our top films. Uh, let's do it. Okay. okay. First up, we have my favorite year or Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Oh, man. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> really? I got to go there? These, Nobody we said do this call was this, easy. Yeah, we do. Sometimes we call these a flick chart hate crime. Hey, Clooney might be listening and I... <laughs> I have to pick between my favorite year between Peter O'Toole and George Clooney. It's like I think Clooney would pick O'Toole. Come on, the guy's got class. He might, but that is, I mean, O Brother is one of that the, is... the Coen Brothers' best. So, gosh, I will say this: I've watched my favorite year many, many times, and I've only watched O Brother twice. Well, that's very telling. So, that so is it. that does is that a vote? Or is that, are you dogging the question? (laughs) Gosh, I thought this was going to be a lot easier. Um, (laughs) I I mean, I love my favorite year. I own it. I don't own O Brother. I own the O Brother soundtrack. So I guess I'm voting for my favorite year. All right. Andy? This is tough. This is tough. I, 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 maybe it's just recency, but I really feel like my favorite year is the one that I would, that I would probably put on. Really? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, brother is so good. Nobody's going to be if offended I, if you pick Oh, brother. I mean, I, you know, this is one point. of those cases because both of you, kind gentlemen, have picked my favorite year. I get to leave this conversation with a, a free conscience. I, I'm picking Oh, brother, but I feel like uh, the, it doesn't matter. No, nobody's, nobody's faulting you. <laughs> There's no judgment here. No, it's a safe space. Okay. My favorite year or the curious case of Benjamin Button. My favorite year. Yeah. I think I'm going to go my favorite year on this too. Yeah, me too. And that I'm, one was easy. Yeah, it was yeah. easy. Benjamin Button has some cool effects, but it's... We're Fincher fans around these parts. I like so. Fincher. I like Fincher too, no question. Uh, but, I, but now not, now uh, all I can think about with... Uh, it's, a, it's a weird thing to think about, but uh, did you see um, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, the most recent version? The remake? No. Uh-uh. Oh, it was so There's, good! It's, oh, actually, it? it's, oh. it's actually really good. But there's a really uh, disturbing bit where he's having one of his fantasies and he's imagining himself as a Benjamin Button type <laughs> of person. And he's, so gross. He's this, it's Horrifying. really disturbing. He's this little tiny, like, old baby. <laughs> <laughs> you can't go wrong with an aged baby. You no. really can't. And Stiller, Stiller nails aged babies. Ooh. Yes, he does. 
but it's it is disturbing. Yeah. Uh, that's fine. Okay, All moving right, on next? though. <laughs> my favorite year or National Lampoon's Vacation, Pete. You my know, favorite I love year. That one. My favorite my year. Favorite year. Um, here I'll pick Vacation, but. <laughs> Sorry, but yes. Okay, my favorite year takes that one. Uh, my favorite year or my favorite movie, Abe, uh, Brazil. Oh, so wow. <laughs> Golly, this was way harder than I thought. Um, I mean, I've really got to be in the mood to watch Brazil, but when I am, I love it, and it is brilliant, and it is made by a genius. I, I'm going to go Brazil. I think I'm going to lock in on Brazil, too. All right. Brazil takes that one. My favorite year or million dollar baby. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite year. Are you, now, are you, are you guffawing there because you didn't like million dollar baby? Did I say that? You're saying that. Don't put words <laughs> in my mouth. <laughs> Clint Eastwood might be listening. <laughs> Um, I didn't make it through my my uh, uh, million dollar baby. Well, that's your problem, man. The best part's the last five minutes. Oh, maybe I'll that's fast it. forward. You can just go to the end. <laughs> It'll totally change your tune. I'm still going to be my favorite year. Oh, boy. I, I might be million dollar baby on this one, but uh, that's okay. That last five my minutes is really takes, good. All right, all right, all right. It's, it's pretty powerful. My favorite year or delicatessen? Oh, man. This Delicatessen one. was one of our top five films uh, yeah. that we introduced to the show this year. That's a um, genius film. That was a listener's choice, and that yeah. was a pretty uh, pretty fun film. I mean, I'm going to have to go Delicatessen on that one. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Okay, Delicatessen. Uh, let's see, my favorite year or another Terry Gilliam film, Time Bandits. Time Bandits. That's one of my childhood this faves. This is brutal. We're brutal. At I know. Movie, this I is think. tough. This is tough. <laughs> no, it's, it's good, though, because... It's good. My favorite year are Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Oh, man. <laughs> Why don't you put it up against, like, fucking... You don't... There's no choice. No. It's random? It's oh, random. Man. All right. It keeps moving. Yeah, once we pick it, 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 that directs it on our list as far as whether it's going up or down. So we've, you know, by beating uh, Oh Brother Where Art Thou at the beginning, it's kind of fighting its, it's way It's already fighting the to the top yeah. film. It's so. doomed. It's doomed. I mean, Close Encounters <laughs> is... All you it need is. is the five tones, and that yeah. that alone beats my favorite year. <laughs> A gentleman does not pick my favorite year in this fight. No, that's right. All right, Close Encounters takes it, and that's it. We are at number twenty out of two hundred sixteen movies on our flick chart with my favorite that's year. Not that's that not bad. That is not no, bad. I think that's great. I think yeah. Absolutely great. That is really great, and I I uh, I love this. You know what else I've been thinking about uh, over the last hour? We've been talking this. This film, I, it feels to me very much like it's it offers some of the spiritual DNA to one of my other very, very favorite, canceled way too soon TV shows, Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip. I think that's that's one of Sorkin, Sorkin's very best. People didn't get it, and it has that same sort of vibe that these guys brought to my favorite year, and that same sort of heart. A little bit darker, definitely a modernized kind of picture of it, but uh, I I just love it. That whole mystique that they captured in, in of this era is a, just a fantastic uh, addition. Yeah, it's interesting, actually. That it seems like there have been quite a few shows that you could sort of put into the same category. I mean, you could take the Tina Fey show, and you could almost take the... Uh, yeah. The, yeah, the, that the, was uh, Thirty Rock. Yeah, or the what's the other Sorkin show? Uh, the network news guys. Uh, yeah, no, the newsroom. Newsroom. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's all. That was definitely wore its politics a little bit more on its sleeve. Yeah, than for Studio sure. Studio sixty for sure. Yeah, but um, yeah, it's interesting. I think that you know that that vibe of or that I don't know if it's a subgenre if we could call it that, but you know you've got that the caretaker taking care of the the crazy person sort of subgenre, right? And what I love about this film is it, it kind of subverts that a little bit because so often with those films the 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 crazy celebrity is the one who ends up kind of changing the the you know the the buttoned up you know person who's supposed to be taking care of them and they're able to kind of let their hair down by the end of it. And this one, what I love is that it's actually the celebrity that it ends up changing and ending up kind of finding that kind of that core for himself again. Yeah, good point. So with that, well, let's, uh, I think we're about done. So uh, let's uh, give it our ratings out of five stars. What would you give this one, uh, Abe? I give this one, I'll give it four. Um, I think you have to reserve five stars for the real 
sort of uh, films for the ages. And although I enjoy this one greatly and I think some of the performances are fantastic, I'm going to go with four. I'm a solid four, too, Andy. Well, I guess I liked it a little bit more. I'm at 4.5. Oh. oh, we do decimals. That's fine. Yeah. That's, I'm glad no, you I, guys enjoyed the film I picked so much. That's, oh, uh, yeah. It's a, it's a fun one to share with people, and I think uh, it's maybe an overlooked gem. Well, as our first speakeasy, you sure make it uh, make it easy on us. We were actually sweating a little bit as we started inviting people. What if they bring movies that are really terrible? That we just really hate. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to watch Transformers? <laughs> Uh, oh dear i'll tell you uh you know the other film that i um if you guys have never seen breaking away that one's that's another uh that's right yeah. early 80s classic for my you know i that's one that we we talked about that i've seen it and i don't i don't have a real sense memory of it that's all right so You'll i'll break there. it out you get there all right oh, you'll, get there. That one. you'll get there <laughs> <laughs> you'll be you man you'll, you'll be, be you you, Pete. <laughs> you be you uh, well, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, it's so much fun having you, man. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's a good. Before time. we head out, is there anything uh, that you have coming up that you want to plug? Yeah, uh, you said at the beginning, um, end of January, look for the big Disney movie, The Finest Hours, uh, starring Chris Pine and Casey Affleck, amongst others. That is the based on the true story of uh, one of the most daring Coast Guard rescues in history. Uh, two oil tankers break in half in the middle of a hurricane in the middle of winter off the massachusetts coast circa 1952 and the coast guard were forced to try to rescue 36 men on a boat only meant to hold 12 um and that was a big huge fun production uh it should be a pretty thrilling ride for the audience uh so that's january 28th or 29th of 2016 have you seen the finished thing? I have not. Uh, we won't see it till the week before. Um, yeah. I've seen bits and pieces, and it's pretty spectacular. It's the biggest thing I've ever worked on by far. Um, yeah, it. We'll see. It, I don't know how it's going to perform, but it should be a fun film to watch. Well, we have that uh, slated on our uh, on our film board, so we'll be talking about that at the end of January. So, yeah, definitely looking forward to that one. And what else? What else? Um, then I, I have a few episodes of a new show uh, from Robert Kirkman, creator of The Walking Dead. Uh, it's a show called Outcast, based on another comic book of his about demons taking over a small town. Uh, and that will be on the soon-to-be-revitalized um, uh, Cinemax Network which is uh, they already have the Nick, but they are working on developing their brand a little bit more strongly with an outcast being one of their uh, big shows starring Patrick Fugit and um, featuring Brent Spiner. Uh, Commander Data. Indeed, Commander Data. And that was pretty cool to uh, be in his presence. Yeah. Oh, uh, so oh, those fun. two things. And then a big uh, gnarly, super violent horror movie called The Belko Experiment, written by James Gunn of Guardians of the Galaxy fame. It's a very violent uh, corporate, uh, corporate showdown with lots of exploding heads and that sort of thing. When's, when's wow. that one coming? That, when, when, how soon can I get tickets? <laughs> that would be um, uh, sometime next summer. I'm awesome. Guessing. How yeah. fun. Exploding heads. Yeah, we love it. Exploding heads. Greg McLean is the director of uh, the Belco Experiment, and he has a, a really great uh, giant alligator movie on Netflix that you can look for. Greg McLean, Australian kid. That's awesome. How funny. Oh, he did Wolf Creek, right? Yeah, he did Wolf Creek. Exactly right. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah he's, so, a, he's, he's a, a bloody director. director. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's violent. <laughs> awesome. Oh, How geez, it, uh, Tony Goldwyn's in that. Yep, Tony Goldwyn uh, is, yep, he does some violent stuff. <laughs> Look at these guys. John C. McGinley's in it. Michael Rooker. Yeah. This is crazy. What a, it's a great cast. It's a great cast. We had a lot of fun. We got to shoot in Bogota, Colombia. My first, oh, wow. first trip to South America. Uh, beautiful place. Great people. And uh, a lot of cool street art and art in general. And, nice. Uh, yeah, it was really a fun experience, uh, and the movie is crazy. Um, beautiful young new uh, starlet named Adria Arjona. Uh, she will be someone to watch in the future, for sure. 
Outstanding. Yeah. Outstanding. All right. We'll put links to all of those things in the uh, in the show notes. Where else should people find you directly? You want people to follow you on Twitter or website, anything yeah, like that? I'm on the Twitter uh, at Abraham Ben Ruby. I'm on the Instagram, which you'll just have to do a little searching to find me. Uh, <laughs> okay. And I'm at, uh, I have AbrahamBenRuby.net if you still bother with actual websites. Um, but Twitter is probably the best way for uh, to find out what I'm up to. Well, thanks so much again for joining us in the next Reels Speak Easy, Abe. Glad to have you. My pleasure. Thank you guys for having me. Absolutely. And for those of you out there, we hope you enjoyed the show. If you like what you heard, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Instagram, Pinterest, Letterboxd, and Flickchart. Jeez. And, of course, I know so many, right? <laughs> And uh, don't forget to head on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and comment. It really does help more people find us. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And until next time, we got to get back to our meatloaf. That's your call sign. <laughs> <laughs> That's a line from the movie. It's a line from the movie, oh. man. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. <laughs> I think you should use that every time. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> Brilliant idea. idea. Brilliant That's idea. awesome. Before we sign off, sure. Uh, would you mind doing a, a, a quick spot read for us? No, uh, no. Hi, this is Abe Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to the next Real Speakeasy. Okay. Hi, this is Abraham Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to the next Real Speakeasy. <sighs> Damn! And then come to my house and read me a bedtime story. Hi, this is Abraham Ben Ruby. Come to my house and read me a bedtime story. <laughs> Wait, that, that was awesome. That I was want? actually an invitation, oh, but now that we've oh. got that recorded, I'm keeping it. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Moon. Good night, Room. I love having these wonderful chats on movies we like with all these industry guests talking about some of their favorite movies. So many great conversations on that show about so many great movies. We have so much fun having these conversations, but producing the show week after week does require a lot of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these incredible conversations. The Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals links to the source material for all the adapted film discussions on The Next Reel's family of podcasts. Purchasing through our links supports the show. It's your one-stop shop for Amazon and Apple links where you can buy your copy of the original source material. Original material for movies we like, movies like Casino Royale. The Silent Partner. Never Let Me Go. Silver Linings Playbook. There Will Be Blood, based on Upton Sinclair's Oil. I believe it's Oil! Oh, yeah. I forgot the exclamation point. <laughs> Plus, by using those links to buy your next read, Apple and Amazon show us a little bit of love, which allows you to support our family of shows with minimal effort. TheNextReel.com slash originals. It's a great way to support the show and find your next page turner. That's right. Head over to TheNextReel.com slash originals to pick out your next read and dig in today. Today.